Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another amazing episode on the Unleashing Potentials podcast. My name is Bernadette Desir, and I'm your host. Today's special guest is Ingrid. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Bernadette. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. I'm honored to have you. Ingrid, you're also in Canada. Can you tell us where in Canada you are? I am located in the province of Ontario in the city of Toronto. Um, living in the beaches area. <laughs> oh, nice. That's awesome. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to unplug my camera. Um, all right. It, it just wasn't working properly uh, for some reason. Here we go. Yeah, there's some type of investigator people in my back alley i don't know who they are <laughs> they're, they're looking they're looking at a tree i don't know if it's something rotting or collapsing or maybe infested in fact yeah, yeah yeah sometimes there's these weird beetle infestations that take over trees at least here in toronto so. oh we've had those too yeah okay sorry go ahead <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Ingrid, can you tell us more about you and what you do? Well, currently I am an advocate and a speaker. Um, I'm also the uh, ideal chief officer at a nonprofit. So ideal is an acronym that stands for inclusion, diversity, equity, accessibility, leading to belonging. And that job title actually really sums up my life's passion and work. I am really dedicated to creating uh, those elements uh, for particularly for uh, communities and individuals that have been pushed to the margins and excluded. I am really dedicated to creating a better world and, and spaces where everyone feels like they fit in and they can be themselves. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so powerful, the work that you're doing. And uh, it's needed, I think, more than ever now, because it seems that every year there's something going on and there are lots of different groups and people that are left out and feel that way. Um, what got you started into the work that you're doing? My life experiences, you know, I, I emigrated from Jamaica to Canada with my family when I was really young, three mm -hmm. years old. Um, so, you know, I'm basically Canadian through and through. You are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you know? are. And so I grew up in an area of Toronto um, and I, I, I lived in uh, social housing. Um, the area that I grew up in, Chester Lee, was kind of... Um, known although I don't think I was aware as a child that it was known as a bad area um, but I, I grew up I experienced some adverse um, experiences including uh, childhood sexual abuse uh, physical abuse emotional abuse and uh, when I was 13 years old in grade seven um, I left home I walked out of my house with just the clothes on my back and I that's when I entered the child welfare system and I lived in foster care and group homes until I moved out on my own at age 17, um, but was still receiving some funding from Children's Aid until I was 21. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, while I was in care, when I was 14 years old, I was diagnosed with a rare degenerative eye disorder called retinitis pigmentosis. Mm -hmm. Tosa, sorry, retinitis pigmentosa. And at that time, I learned that this was a rare disease. Um, there was no cure, there was no treatment, and that I would and had been actually uh, slowly going blind my whole entire life. Um, so that was pretty devastating news <laughs> on mm -hmm. top of trying to recover from sexual abuse, on top of living in foster care. And, um, you know, we all know um, what a trial that can be mm -hmm. um, and trying to finish school and, and all of that. So I did experience a lot of exclusion and discrimination based on a lot of factors, being Black, being female, being in foster care, um, you know, having survived sexual abuse. I didn't receive a lot of sympathy for that. A lot of times, a lot of scorn um, mm -hmm. and derision, um, a lot of ableism. I didn't know that term. That term didn't exist then, but absolutely feeling excluded because of uh, my disability and some difficulties that I had. 
you know, but really pushing through because I loved school. School was my life and I loved learning. And fortunately for me, I did well in school uh, for the most part. And so really thought and bought into that idea that we are fed as children, that if you get your education, you know, your life is going to be great. Uh, that's the key to a really good life. And so I fought really hard. Um, I graduated from high school with, with honors. I went on to college and graduated with honors. And then I went to university. And it, it took me a really long time because by that time I was legally blind. My sight had diminished to that point. Mm -hmm. And so I could only do two courses a year. Um, but that was allowed as a person with a disability that was still considered full time, but it was really difficult. The technology wasn't the same as it is now. So I, I still had to read books, like literally not digitally. Mm -hmm. And so, and, you know, and, and write all your essays and stuff. So it took me like at least 10 years <laughs> to get my BA. Uh, and yes. I thought, this is it. My life is going to be easy street, peachy keen. I graduated with a very high GPA mm -hmm. over 4.0. I couldn't wow. get a job to save my life. Wow. No one would hire me. No one would touch me. Um, you know, as a as a visually impaired person, nobody wanted to take me on. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it was that was a really bitter pill, I'll tell you, um, mm -hmm. to swallow after all that I had been through and fought through to have that uh, be the end result was uh, really bitter. I, I did mm -hmm. fall into a really deep depression for many mm -hmm. years after that. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing and I'm just honored to be talking to you. And my heart uh, hurts to hear the experiences that you've been through. I don't think anyone should go through that, regardless of their disability, regardless of their skin color and, and ethnicity and many other aspects. And I'm grateful for you, my friend, because you are moving the next generation to freedom. And the work that you do, regardless of how hard it was, you persisted and continue to fight for what you knew was right. And um, I've been in foster care too. Mm. <laughs> Mine's a messy one. It's very complex because I was adopted and it, it's uh, international adoption. There are many other terms as well. And the abuse and the neglect that goes in foster care. Yeah. Most of the time, the people that are making those decisions that are in power, government and leaders, they 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 don't really get too deep into that. They just cr scratch on top of the surface. What are your thoughts? We are corralled. <laughs> we are corralled. They are, you know, and that's how I felt. I thought when I walked out of my house when I was 13 years old, that mm -hmm. I had fought my way, that I had courageously made a decision mm -hmm. um, that was going to free me from all that I had been enduring. And instead, I continued to endure the same, just different environments, just different locations. And that was a real shock for me um, mm -hmm. to realize that I actually hadn't liberated myself from abuse, <laughs> that I had just changed yeah. locations and, and abusers. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I lived in several foster homes. And, and after a time, I said to my social worker, no more. Yeah. Just put me in a group home. I'm not going to be lulled into this false dream of being welcomed into a home mm -hmm. only to have that fall apart at the slightest mm -hmm. thing that you do that kids do, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kids do. But when you're a foster kid and you do it, you're treated as if you're, you're, you're an alien, like as if you're doing it is so horrific and deserves, you know, the most terrible uh, punishment or the fact that because you have been abused that gives other people license to abuse you more um, mm -hmm. instead of wanting to protect you from that they feel like you know I, I heard I had people say to me well you're already used to it <laughs> wow you know? and people don't realize that you know that 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 vulnerability attracts way more predators than it does humanitarians and I, I always say that we have this illusion to think that children who are abused uh, are met with gentleness and the majority that we're met with is while well, you're damaged goods, you know, yeah. and, and when I lived in a group home, uh, the second group home I lived in, I actually lived there for four, uh, three and a half years. And yeah. the average day was about six months to a year max. Um, and so I, I pretty much grew up there in my adolescence. And so I met tons of girls and I have heard tons of stories 
Um, and so I understand uh, exactly what you, when you're describing like your experience, um, it's just a nod for me. Like I, I understand the incredible and variety of, of abuse uh, that has been experienced um, in the system at the hands of folks um, who work in it, who are creating and who are making these rules is, um, is, is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, to most of those people, it's a paycheck for them, right? Every child is a paycheck. Yeah. And there, there are folks who are not, like I did meet like really genuine uh, staff who, who really impacted positively on my life and actually who I am still in touch with um, to this day. Um, but they are, they were not the majority and and even and I noticed that even like with the group home, like with the staff who came in, like who come in all like ready to take on the world and make change. And it's so interesting to see how quickly I remember just predicting, OK, three months from now, because <laughs> they get burnt out very quickly. It's hard work and I'm not going to deny it. And 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 foster kids can be like a, a tough group, too. We, we are dealing with trauma. You're dealing with traumatized youth. Mm -hmm. um, who are reacting and behaving from trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to pretend like that, those, that it's an easy job, but it's a job that you have to be committed to and come into um, with a heart. And I just saw so many people who, um, you know, after like just a few months were like done, like they're empathy was all gone already <laughs> <laughs> it, it had been used up they were over that and then it became just a matter of enforcing rules enforcing policies implementing programs and and that's that's not what creates a good life mm -hmm. you know and that's what I meant before when I said about like being corralled and just being managed until you know you're thrown out of the system at age 18 um, you know, and I, and I know, and I still continue to work in child welfare. And so I, I am fully aware of the move and the push that has been largely led by uh, youth in care to change the system. Mm -hmm. And so I know that there has been development and progress, uh, and I want to acknowledge that, um, but also to still be aware that we still have a ways to go. Yeah. Yeah. How much progress would you say have happened from the time you were there to right now? Well, what I can see uh, when I first think about the noticeable differences that I can say is that youth and care um, are invited to have a lot more say and agency in their care plans. Like when mm -hmm. I was in care, we didn't have any. The adults made all the decisions. They kept things from you. There were plenty of us who didn't even know the full scope of your own story and they used the excuse of protecting children as a, but that was also used to manipulate uh children as well everybody has a right to the full knowledge of their story no matter how painful that may be and nobody has mm -hmm. the right to keep that from you and um mm -hmm. I, I can't say that that's a hundred percent been changed but mm -hmm. i think there is um there 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 is they're doing better in that sense of uh, of having kids have some agency and involvement mm -hmm. and he listening mm -hmm. to children's voices um as i said there's still room to go uh, but that is one way that i can see the difference in the empowerment of youth in care today uh than from my time is that they're very knowledgeable of their rights mm -hmm. um and knowledgeable of avenues of um looking for help Mm -hmm. um when things aren't going right um unfortunately here in Ontario we have lost our children and youth provincial advocate which was a humongous resource for youth in care um but uh there are still a, a few avenues left for youth in care to turn to when they are seeking um support from within the system because you know not all the abuse comes from outside of it yeah 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 I agree um would you be willing to also talk about uh, the sexual abuse that you endured and how did you heal from it? Mm -hmm. uh, so my sexual abuse occurred um, uh, with my stepfather, um, which started uh, when I was 11 years old. Um, mm -hmm. I had actually um, cut the back of my ankle. My brother and I were 
kind of playing around in the basement and there was like a board that had a nail in it and I fell on it and gouged out the back of my ankle and mm -hmm. for us that was a huge deal because uh, we weren't allowed to get hurt getting hurt I mean I was going to get it beaten um, you know if I ever fell down and scraped myself that wasn't met with sympathy that was met with a beating <laughs> you weren't allowed to hurt yourself mm -hmm. and so my brother and I made a pact that we wouldn't tell because, you know, he would have gotten in trouble for pushing me and I would have gotten in trouble for getting hurt. Mm -hmm. um, so we did, and it got infected uh, because I didn't say anything. And so I started limping and my um, mother noticed I was limping. And then when she found out what had happened, uh, she was like, well, she refused to take me to get medical treatment. It was just like, mm -hmm. that's your problem. You made that decision. So mm -hmm. that's, you're going to live with that infection. And so my stepfather took it upon himself to take care of it to nurse it um which seems like really great on the surface <laughs> so every day he would bathe uh my ankle with a com with dead all and water and um dead all is an antiseptic that's really used in the caribbean a lot for people who don't know um and so we would be in the bathroom and i, I would be like leaning over the sink and have like you know he'd be sitting on the the toilet like with the seat down and I have my ankle in his lap and he'd be like bathing it and you know for me it was nothing I mean it hurt and I was glad that he was taking care of it for me but I don't know what was going through his head with my positioning mm. you know I was still a kid but obviously you know something um was happening there and mm -hmm. I did have uh I, I was like uh, I used to steal money when I was a kid, I used to still change um, just to be able to go to the store and that because I never had access to money, but my brothers would. I was the only girl with like four brothers. Mm -hmm. And so every now and again, I would get caught and I would get in trouble. And so I had stole some money and um, I was getting beaten <laughs> for that. And my mother, mm -hmm. you know, you had to like get naked, right? You, you had to strip naked. That was like the custom strip naked. And then you would have this leather belt and you'd be like whipped with this belt. Um, because I had stolen the chain from my stepfather, um, my mother had had brought him into the room when she was beating me. So he saw me completely unclothed and it was the next day that he started abusing me. Um, and, you know, he told me, of course, you know, the usual that you can't tell anybody in the, um, you know, that my mother would never believe me and which I also completely agreed that she would not believe me. So I really felt like I didn't have any avenues and I would try to like avoid being alone. Um, but when I wasn't alone, I would get in trouble. Like I just always got in trouble for something. Um, with my mom so before my habit would have been to stay out of sight of her but now I had to try to stay kind of within sight but not too much because if I was alone he would be coming after me but I was yeah. in view of my mother I'd be getting in trouble it was an impossible situation uh for me and one that was filled with terror like my heart would be racing all the time uh when I was at home because I just never knew um what would be coming my way uh, from mm -hmm. anyone and the, the hard part was that I knew I should tell and then the longer that I didn't tell the more my mind would condemn me like oh you didn't tell and look how long it's been how are you going to explain that now and then I'd be racking my brain how am I going to explain why I didn't tell and then more time is going by and more abuse is happening and and then you know you just feel trapped mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know and a lot of people ask and condemn uh, sexual abuse survivors uh, for that. It, it's, it's something that just, you know, makes me go mad. It's like, you have no idea yeah. uh, what a, a person who's being abused goes through and, and the torture that mm -hmm. we are going through on our own already. And, and then to face that type of condemnation when you finally um, mm -hmm. are able to harness that courage to come out and tell um it, it's so devastating when you are not met you know with a warm reception and instead you're met with more accusations of, yeah. well if that was true why didn't you tell sooner mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you so much for sharing I'm trying to hold back tears <laughs> uh because I'm gonna say me too 
right? And I, I admire your strength and courage to open up and talk about it because it's helping me and it's going to be helping many, many other people. People that are not ready to talk about it and people that are sort of getting ready to talk about it. And the way that it's stigmatized, um, it's like a nice stigma stigmatization, if I may put it that way. I don't know if you've heard of the term nice racism. It's there. We all just kind of pretend that it doesn't hurt, that it's not impacting people. What would you like to see uh, differently when it comes to how professionals help uh, tra trauma patients or all types of traumatic situations? Mm -hmm. Whether it's professionals or whether it's a friend or a family member, the first thing I would like to see is just compassion and empathy. And the one thing that I would advise is no why questions, nothing that begins with a why. Not why didn't you tell, not why did you go there, not why, nothing mm -hmm. that begins with a why. Because no matter how much you don't think that you are you know, being cruel, it, any why question is because it's, it's a veiled accusation. Yeah. Um, it's a veiled um, chiding of a person's, uh, you know, experience and, and what they had to do to survive in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I welcome, uh, how were you feeling? What did you do next? Um, what happened next but nothing please that yeah. begins with a why yeah and and the other thing it would be is if you are going to be working with someone who has had this experience mm -hmm. you have to work on yourself and your ability to hold that space because it is not easy mm -hmm. and it does it's difficult but when someone is opening up and letting out all that pain the last thing that they need is to be shut up and shut down because you can't handle even hearing about something that they have experienced that they have held the amount of times um that I remember uh being shut down because of someone's inability um mm -hmm. to even listen to that experience I would really really um encourage folks to it's okay to cry it's okay to feel that pain but it's not okay to shut someone else down um because of your inability um yeah. to handle simply hearing because your hearing is not nowhere near in comparison um to the fact that that person that's a memory yeah it's a memory yeah. that holds so much more um, heartache and pain and emotion um, mm -hmm. than just the ears hearing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I have PTSD and oh, um, <laughs> for so long, people thought that PTSD only happened to veterans, like firefighters, police mm -hmm. officers, and mm -hmm. those people who are in the front line. But really, that's not the case. No, it's actually statistically... Yeah, I'm sorry that I no, interrupted you, but yeah. it's already been statistically proven that uh, youth in care have higher rates of PTSD than than war veterans. Yeah, youth in care, and that'll be shocking <laughs> for a lot. It won't be shocking for us in no. care because we yeah. absolutely know and have witnessed, um, you know, our own pain and others. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's yeah, it's been proven that youth in care have higher rates of yeah. PTSD than war veterans. Yeah, 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 yeah. I believe you. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm still, I get triggered every second of every day, and it's been years and years and years. And the vivid imagery that I get, I can describe them all, and yeah. I try to forget them, and I'm not. And it, it it impacts everything in life for me. Yeah, let's talk about disability and diversity. Mm -hmm. I I live with disability, but I want to hear from you first. Right. So. Uh, let me describe my condition and and how I see, well, not anymore, but like growing up. So mm -hmm. the condition that I have retinitis pigmentosa, it's where the retinas of your eyes, and that's the, the colored part around the black part, mm -hmm. um, 
where that is slowly dissolving and that's due to the UVA and UVB rays of the sun. So the sun is basically like acid on the retinas and they are, imagine like, you know, when you pour acid on something, it develops holes and it starts eating away and disappearing. That's basically what the sun is doing uh, to the retina. And so my whole life, uh, you know, that part of my eye has been dissolving and it's something that I was born with. It's genetic. Mm -hmm. Um, also with that, you also get tunnel vision. So your peripheral view is very constricted. You don't see as far um, up, down, and to the left and right as someone else. When you just look straight ahead and hold your eyes straight, there's an amount that you can see. And for people with RP, it's very constricted. It's a, it's a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, also, our eyes, our pupils don't adjust to different lighting so when you go inside from outside when you go in the movie theater at night or evening your pupils either open up or they constrict to so that you can see in the different lighting our eyes don't do that so in dim lighting i've never been able to see at night ever uh in my life or when it's dim something as simple as going from the sun to the shade or coming indoors from outside could render me momentarily like unable uh, to see mm -hmm. and the last thing is that because of the the constriction around the peripheral vision we also lack depth perception so my world is very very flat it looks like when you're looking at a picture that's what my real life looks like so I understand this now as an adult and after many years and you know and being educated as a child I had no idea about any of this um, mm -hmm. I had no idea that I saw differently from anyone else wow. and so I would bump into things all the time and uh, I would get in trouble for that um, mm -hmm. I would not be able to find things that I was told I was looking right at for instance if my mom asked me to get a pen off the coffee table I would go there and I would look and I'd be like, I don't see any pen. And then I, you know, I'd be getting yelled at. It's right there. You're looking right at it. But for me, things, because of the lack of 3D vision, things collapse into other things for me. So for me, the pen was actually embedded in the table and looked like a design on the table. Now, it didn't look like a pen in the table. It looks abstract for me, right? And sometimes people sitting on furniture, I can't tell they're on the furniture. They're in it and so I don't see a person in the furniture I would see abstract like their clothing and stuff it would yeah. look like abstract design or maybe different I would think maybe is that different cloth on the table mm -hmm. and so when I'm staring at somebody and saying I don't see the person or I'm staring at something and say I don't see it I'd be told oh you're you know you're acting silly you're being stupid so it would of course it was thought corporal punishment will straighten her up so I got beaten slapped hit like almost like every single day because of course I was always doing something that people just thought you're just being stupid you're just pretending it doesn't make any sense but of course rare diseases present differently yeah. right and of course I could still walk around I still moved I went to school I went to the store but I didn't understand that I the way I was seeing the world wasn't the same and I didn't get diagnosed until I was in care I mean, I did get glasses when I was in grade three because my grade three teacher insisted to my mom that, no, I don't care if she says she can see something is wrong. So I got glasses, which did improve my vision, but I still had all the same problems I had before. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so when you're unable, when you navigate differently and you seem strange and you're unable to do certain things, like you just get written off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, friends would just forget about me I wouldn't get invited to certain things um you know and, and because it's not something that people could see or tell just by looking at me mm -hmm. um you know I didn't receive any accommodations um in school I, I I didn't receive any any modifications or expectations even though I couldn't see the board and I even though I always sat in the front row of every class I could never see the board I, I would have to find my own workarounds for things. I'd either write very quickly. I had to learn to write very quickly when the teacher was talking because I had to take notes from their talking and not from their writing because I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. um, at the group home, I was still mm -hmm. expected to do nighttime outdoor chores, even though they knew I couldn't see in the dark. They knew it, but I would still get punished if it didn't get done. And I would have to rely on asking someone to help me. And if they felt like helping me, that'd be great. But if, 
for whatever reason, nobody wanted to help me that day, which they had every right to not do. They had their own chores. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would get in trouble for that. Um, so it, it, it's crazy, like even just voicing mm -hmm. that. But that's the reality of many people with, with disabilities that you get left out, that you get excluded, that accommodations are not made for you. It's just, oh, well, so sad. You can't do that. You can't go there. Mm -hmm. Not our problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and people don't give consideration to the the emotional and mental health effects of that, the loneliness, yeah. um, the exclusion, um, the mm -hmm. feeling of unworthiness, mm -hmm. um, the inability to see a future for yourself. It, it's so, so much. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. Um, I can't say I understand when it comes to the eyesight, but mm -hmm. when it comes to, I live, I, I'm so young, right? I live with chronic pain and it's constant and, and schizophrenia and PTSD, all those it's constant. And I had to get accommodations and I still struggled with that. And you're right. It, it's hard. It, it hurts the soul, the heart and the being that is going through those challenges we want to be heard. We want to be seen and appreciated. Mm -hmm. And we want to be left alone most of the time and not be criticized or judged for not being or mocked. normal or mocked. Yeah, for not being normal. Mm -hmm. And which takes me to my next topic, which is, you know, bowling at school and name callings, all of that. Because it happens there as you were expressing your experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. I just participated recently in a educational summit for educators on um, supporting students with disabilities. And yeah. some of the tips that I had for them was there, the necessity of administrators and teachers to set this environment of inclusion right from the get-go, right from the top, mm -hmm. and that nobody will be left out and everybody has to be aware of that. And you set that environment throughout the school and within the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And really to dispel the notion of that needs are for people with disability. I am so sick of that. Everybody has needs. Everybody has areas of strength and everybody has areas where they need assistance, not just students with disabilities, not just people with disabilities. So if we can really dispel this notion of them versus us and just talk about us and a, an appreciation of that, that we all have areas where we're strong, including people with disabilities, they can lead. And we all have areas where we need help. So to stop separating and categorizing ourselves yeah. and to teach children, build it in children from the get-go, that appreciation and that understanding and that everyone is going to be included and that adapting games, uh, exercises, activities so that someone can participate, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. We don't have to have something that's standard and unchangeable, that it's okay for things to be fluid, that things can be changed and done a bit differently. That's okay to ensure that everybody can participate, to mm -hmm. ensure that students with disabilities are having the opportunity to lead, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to show yeah. what they can do. Yes, we need accommodations, but we have gifts to give. We have talents mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And those need to be showcased mm -hmm. and appreciated. Mm -hmm. And they also need to automatically, there is no harm that should be gone unaddressed. None. I don't care how little it is. Yeah. And children, you know, our children, things will come up, names, calling can happen. But the point is that the adults have to address it. There's no minimizing. Mm -hmm. There's no defending or excusing something mm -hmm. that someone has said or done. Mm -hmm. It has to be addressed every time. And that ensures protection for everyone. Everybody knows if I am hurt or harmed, something is going to happen. A discussion is going to happen. Uh, um, you know, uh, 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 there's going to be some type of penalty, uh, perhaps depending on the situation, the cause of it, you mm -hmm. know, the how many times it's happened you know what i mean i don't want to i never like to lay down these absolute ground rules because you have to take each situation uh, into consideration and then deal with it as it as it is but it should be addressed all the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know yeah. and that that creates a, an environment of safety um mm -hmm. for everyone and mm -hmm. that shows like silence only helps the oppressors it only helps the bullies yeah. Uh, when they're allowed to to get away with, uh, you know, racist, homophobic, mm -hmm. um, 
ableist comments yeah. and so when you create a, a place where everyone knows that that's not going to be tolerated and mm -hmm. where infractions are dealt with consistently mm -hmm. then that culture is going to change and it's going yeah. to change for yeah. the better yeah yeah and unfortunately it, it's happening every single day at wow. school and it does so, anger me because kids go to learn not to abuse each other at school and you're right. I think there needs to be more that uh, to be done on behalf of uh, chairmen and, and CEOs or principals or whoever it is that's in charge. They need to understand their responsibilities and they need to know when it's time to take action, like serious mm -hmm. actions, because that can truly damage a person. That's a person. Absolutely. Person. And we have seen that. We've mm -hmm. seen the damaging effects of bullying and mm -hmm. suicide rates and yeah. also violence. Yes. You know, when a person who can't take it anymore retaliates, mm -hmm. that can be devastating. And we need to prevent yeah. that. And mm -hmm. we need to take intentional and direct action, as you said, to mm -hmm. to prevent that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 More action. Yeah, I agree. Um, is there anything else we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? Um, just talking about, well, I, I can also ident identify <laughs> another aspect yes. of my advocacy and my life experience. So when I was 16, I, I had another diagnosis. So I was diagnosed with um, polycystic ovary syndrome. And that's a, that involves a hormone imbalance uh, in women where we have uh, too much uh, testosterone. Mm -hmm. And so that impacts uh, on a physiological level. Um, it, it impacts like our, our menstrual cycles, mm -hmm. our ability to bear children. And it also causes uh, uh, excessive uh, hair growth, right? So I uh, began to uh, grow a beard. I shave like every day. But uh, when I was younger, and because I didn't have like good shaving techniques at all, because I didn't know about shaving your face, um, you know, I, I had this really stark uh, five o'clock shadow, you know, and my skin was all like bruised and cut and because mm -hmm. of I didn't shave well and plus I I didn't have a lot of money so I didn't I wouldn't use a blade once and throw it out I would use it three or four yeah. times but you know most people know like especially men who mostly shave their, they know that that's a no-no you do yeah. not reuse a blade ever you use it once you throw it out uh, mm -hmm. so my skin was inflamed I had this really dark prominent five o'clock shadow mm -hmm. so everybody could see that I shaved and I was perceived and still am sometimes as a trans woman. And so I endured so much uh, abuse socially when I went outside. And particularly, I have to say the most for my own Black community, because the Black community, not the only one, but this is my community. So I have to say historically, extremely homophobic. Um, mm -hmm. And so the names that I would be called, being spat on, being pointed at, laughed, mocked, uh, being called a he, she, uh, faggot, um, being refused service, or sometimes at the store having money thrown at me, my chain, they wouldn't touch me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so many, so many things. Having people talk about me right in front of my face. What is that? Is that a, a he or a she? And then dissect me from head to toe. No, I think it's a she because of this. No, no, it's a he because of that. And I, I just, it was it's incredible how cruel and the audacity of people when they feel and um, when they judge you as unworthy whether it's based on your race your gender anything when people feel that you're unworthy they feel no way to treat you badly and we like to think of that as only being a certain type of person like a bully it's not true that nice woman that you see on the side of the street there oh that nice woman will do that too people always like to think of yeah. it as somebody else it's you you yeah. do that I was able to think it's you I've had that happen to me from old people middle-aged people yeah. young people children white people black people Chinese people Indian people male female <laughs> whatever it, anybody yeah. once yeah. they determine for whatever reason if they're not racist then maybe they're ableist if they're not ableist then maybe they're homophobic but because I have so much intersectionality, I've seen and experienced all the different forms of discrimination and oppression. And I see how people, I see how Black people cry 
and get angry over racism. And that same person will turn around and be so ableist, will turn around and be so homophobic. And it's like, okay, I always tell people, you understand your own pain, but you don't care about somebody else's pain. You don't like the way you're being discriminated against, but you're okay to give it to somebody else. That infuriates me. You can probably hear it in my tone. It really does because it shows a lack of compassion and empathy for others. You cannot only care about yourself and your community and don't give a damn about the next community and the next person. No, mm -hmm. that same pain that you feel for yourself, you do not have the right to cause it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I'm re really working to get people to see how they can be the victim in this situation and the oppressor in the next one. And you and mm. people like don't realize it sometimes. Like I can really hear they're like, oh my gosh. It's like, yes, we have to care about each other as human beings. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have this right to like not want to be harmed but feel okay to cause it. No. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. seeing so much of that now with the, you know, the, the anti-LGBTQ laws that are really taking place in the States, but oh, Canada, you're not flying under the radar either. Yeah. It's yeah. bad here. The anti-Semitism lately, mm -hmm. that Islamophobia, it, we, we still have some of the racism, the anti-Black racism is still like very high. We have so many issues. We're making progress in some ways. And oh my God, the little bit that we make, other people just want to claw it back. And the silence that I'm seeing, the bystanding, mm, it's very that, scary. That to me. It's very, very scary because we, this is how it all began. Everything, you know, when we talk about the Holocaust and all, silence when you ask people afterwards why were you silent and they don't even have an answer and we keep saying never again we keep saying never again and never again is happening every day yes every day yes yes mm. yeah sorry bernadette i get really no, passionate no. i get really emotional about about uh no. yeah i get really uh, and that's why i'm committed to like everyone i don't want anyone to be feeling oppressed, to be feeling like they can't be themselves mm -hmm. because I understand the pain of that, me you know? Too. And so I, what I don't want for me, I don't want for anybody else either. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's been so much to me to, to participate in any work that is really mm -hmm. pushing back against oppression, against stigmatization, against discrimination, mm -hmm. and just really is about creating a better world and a better you know, better environments and spaces yes. for people to have the opportunity to participate in society. People mm -hmm. with disabilities can't get a job. And we have such a huge gap in the labor market in this country. Yeah. And there are so many talented people with mm -hmm. disabilities out there and they won't, yeah. they won't get, they don't get a chance because why? Because they have to work remotely, which before the pandemic, all the employers said was impossible. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We've shown that it absolutely is not. And if we can have more, you know, uh, flexibility in work hours, do we have to work nine to five or can we just get the job done? Mm. You know? Oh, my friend, I love listening <laughs> to you talking. Yeah, you're going to have to come back again because I've been looking for someone like you to talk about those topics, to to talk about racism, just to open up to talk about it. And I'm going to say me too in many aspects, as you can see, my skin color, right? I've I've faced racism in so many places, mm -hmm. also by older people. When I take the public bus, I have a white child that's, that's half black, half white. I've faced that with black people too. It's like, yes. what? what? Yes. I used to go to a church. It was black, but there was all kind of people welcome. And I stopped going because I was out of like, I was crawling out of my skin. I was so uncomfortable around my own people. They were so easy and quick to judge me and Been my there. decision. Praise Been the Lord. There. You know, I'm praise so, the Lord. Why yes. she have a kid who's half white, right? Yeah, so how can that be? All of that. I face the same. We can have these conversations, break them down because it's the same. <laughs> I haven't been back to church since the pandemic. Actually, I went, someone invited me and I went for the first time mm -hmm. um, a couple weeks ago. But the same thing, because I cannot deal with this. You can't be touting one thing here and then you're you're doing something else and you're okay with that. It comes back to the same issue with me. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I can't have that. Or at times, I, I would tell you, there was a long time in my life where the Black community was the one that I avoided the most. 
Me the too. Mo- Me too. <laughs> the pain. The pain. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I'm still sometimes I get like ousted or silenced when I, but when I bring up, you know, issues within our community, but I'm still going to do it. I don't care if it's not popular. Yeah. We got to face that, yeah. you know, and I know that there's a over representation of back children in care. And I absolutely do agree that a lot of that, or some of that is due to mm-hmm. racism, but not all of it, honey. I'm sorry. Yes. You're not going to get away with saying that we have issues with how, you know, violence, how we raise our children. Um, and nobody wants to look at that too, but you need to. Not every black child who's in care was, you know, stolen or, you know what I mean? <laughs> Some of them absolutely need to be there. So yeah. let's talk about totally ab- um, abolishing the system. Slow down. Yeah. I hate when people try to ricochet and go the complete opposite way and they think that's the solution. No, it isn't because some of us need to be removed from our homes. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I'm not saying that there isn't an issue, but yeah. it's not everybody. Some kids are in abusive homes. <laughs> they yeah. need to be taken away. Of yeah. course, we want to go to kinship and we want to look at keeping people, you know, and youth in their communities and connected to their families. Absolutely. That has to be the first step. We want to do that, but uh, it's so annoying to have people, you know, kind of think that just going the total opposite way is the solution. No, it isn't. It's not that simple. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have things I tell people, if we abolish racism today, that community is still going to have problems. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're still going to have issues. We have things we have to do with within. Mm -hmm. And I'm not denying the oppression that we face from without, but we have issues within that are going to remain even if racism completely disappeared and that we have to be willing to address. We can't still keep turning a blind eye. We can't still only keep making comedies about it. Mm. (laughs) Because it's it's funny and it ain't funny at the same time, okay? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's suffocating. It is. It's like I was walking around breathing, but I wasn't living. Yeah, yeah. And I was told how to be by society, by culture. Yes, by how to be race. black. Hello, yeah. I was born yeah. black. You know, <laughs> you talk white, you look yeah. white, or the things you do are white. Oh, give me, I don't want to hear that crap. <laughs> yeah 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 and that doesn't mean that i don't love my community or love my culture because i like something different mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know there's so much better that we could talk forever <laughs> but, you know what we're gonna schedule something and have you back because this is this is needed i absolutely love who you are your spirit your soul and your passion and desire to help not only people in canada around the world Mm -hmm. you are changing the world my friend you are you just flip mine upside down within an hour so (laughs) (laughs) so glad to meet you bernadette we have so much in common like i would so much enjoy yeah i would enjoy talking to you anytime yeah yes 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 we'll have you back for sure um i have three minutes two questions for you my friend what is the meaning of life for you Oh my gosh, service. Ooh, nailed it. Nailed it. (laughs) Yes. Um, Where can my listeners find you and support the work that you're doing? Oh, you can find me on Facebook. It's Ingrid Palmer. Um, You can find me on LinkedIn. It's Ingrid Palmer as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I haven't been on Twitter or X or whatever they call it, but on, Mm -hmm. what's it called again? I don't know. I don't know. Use... called Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. You can see yeah. how, how good we are at social media, right? <laughs> on Instagram, though, I am focus on ability life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Focus on ability life. Yes, yes. So absolutely would love to keep in touch. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And love to connect uh, with people. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Well, Ingrid, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this amazing conversation. Wow, I'm blown away. Good thing I'm wearing a, a solid clothes. I'm just <laughs> blown away. <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. This has really been enjoyable. It's been yeah. great talking to you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Always, always. And I can't wait for you to come back again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.